I'm really privileged and honored to be here today. I say this with all sincerity. Every time I go to a training or anything like that, I love being in a room with other people who've dedicated their lives to helping other people heal and recover and transform. So I'm honored to be among this group of people, peers. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm just passionate about learning. So there's things I want to talk about, what I'm passionate about, but I hope that doesn't across, come across in any way as I know it all or anything like that. So I want to learn from you guys today. I wanted to um, go to this material, but leave as much time as I can for Q&A, because I love interacting more than anything else. And I also want to always take one of these moments and just express my gratitude um, for just the love and mercy of God that I'm even standing here today. Um, when I think of like some of the places I've come from with all this and how for years I threw my potential away on drugs and alcohol and stupid choices. Um, whenever I'm standing here talking to a group of people, it just astounds me sometimes that I actually made it to this point and I'm standing here presenting this stuff to you guys. So um, the drug and alcohol part's gone. I'm still working on the stupid decision part. <laughs> um, so um, what I want to talk about today is what I really believe strongly needs to change in the way we treat addiction. And I want to be respectful of that. Um, the biggest thing I want to start with is probably the most important part of this for me, which is I want to um, really say, like, if we're really going to make transformation in this field, we've got to stop drawing the lines in the sand and fighting each other. Um, when I got involved in the field, I had no much idea how much um, animosity or what's between like therapy, 12 steps, uh, therapeutic models, all this kind of stuff. Everybody has a piece, everybody has value to give. So if we're really gonna change things, we've gotta unite and you know stop fighting. I don't know, maybe that's just my personal experience and you haven't had that experience. So the things I talk about today, if they sound like I'm disputing certain things, I wanna recognize that everything has value and everybody has value to give in relation to this. And I want to bring value to you guys today. So one of the reasons that this is so important is, this is hard for me to wrap my head around, is that since 1999, almost 750,000 people have died of opiate overdoses. That's not a total accumulation of substance abuse overdoses. That's just opiate overdoses, that's not suicide related, homicide related, um, accidents, um, all that kind of stuff, you know? I mean, the magnitude, it's like if almost all of Palm Beach County just dropped dead. Um, you know, I mean, it's just astounding to me. I mean, and we need better models of how to treat addiction. When I started in the field, I started working, um, my first job as a full-time therapist, and, you know, I was dedicated to helping people uh, you know, having these great sessions, people were doing transformative work, um, having breakthroughs, and then within the first three to six, nine months, almost every fucking client relapsed. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what is going on here? Um, these clients are sincere, dedicated, um, what am I missing here? So I thought, okay, I've got to come up, maybe it's just, they need relapse prevention skills. That's the main thing right now. You know, we can get to the therapeutic stuff later. And I would try to do that with them, and then the majority of them would relapse. And if they didn't relapse, they just switched compulsions. Right, I mean, I had um, one client had the bariatric surgery, I had no history of alcohol use disorder, and then she became a full-blown alcoholic. Right, I had another client who was an alcoholic who gained 65 pounds his first two months out of treatment. And so what I came to realize, I'm also a trauma specialist, that's a real passion of mine, is that people, um, where this stuff was in the brain was on a subcortical level. And so all the cortical interventions through cognitive therapy, behavior therapy, again, I'm not saying it doesn't have value, is not sufficient to address things on a subcortical level. And so what I wanna argue for today is right now, predominantly in treatment, um, experiential therapies like EMDR, brain spotting, somatic experiencing, ADP, are like adjunct treatments. 
And especially with the amount of time that you have with a client, 30, 60, 90 days at best, I'm arguing that they need to be the primary modality and everything else needs to be adjunct. Um, and I'm gonna explain why that is. So, again, we have to go where the evidence leads based on experience the clinicians are having, the data, the science, and move away from um, the status quo, what has always been, you know? So, in addressing things so cortically, uh, there's one point there at the end I also wanted to make reference to, is this is a very individualized thing. When you understand what happens neurologically and neurochemically, everybody has a unique history. That you can't just have a cookie cutter model of how to treat addiction. When you look at, um, it's a great book, I would say, uh, is probably the best book I've read top to bottom on addiction. It's a newer book called Unbroken Brain. I can't pronounce the lady's name because it's a really crazy name. But if you go on Amazon, Unbroken Brain. And when I read that book, a lot of the ideas I have coalesced. And really what the science is leading us to is that addiction is a developmental learning disorder. When you understand what is happening, like if you have a baby that's addicted to you know, heroin or cocaine, once that baby is weaned off of the physical dependency of those drugs, they will not crave those drugs. Even though they were born physically dependent or addicted, they haven't learned anything yet. There's really only, if you take everything, whether it's a relational issue, a spiritual issue, uh, occupational, uh, whatever it may be, there's only two reasons people use if you break things down to their simplest terms. And that's regulating an effective state or a condition trigger. And both of these are the result of learning. The majority of people who use drugs do not become addicted. That's like astounding with the population we work with to even say, right? So in 90% of addictions develop within adolescence. Outside of infancy, that is the um, most dynamic part of brain reconstruction. So things that happen in that period where we're starting to move away from you know, parental attachment, things like that, and start to learn some individual ways to regulate affect. Uh, anything that imprints during that period is gonna have a you know, tremendous effect on future life. And I'm gonna explain some of how attachment gets imprinted on a neurochemical and neuroanatomical level. And so, how many people here do EMDR? Okay, brain spotting, SC, any of those things? One brain spotting for <laughs> So here for me, here's what the part where I get tomatoes thrown at me, is when I start talking about the disease model. So what I want to say is this, like, we have an evolution to treatment and the knowledge that we're acquiring. The parallel would be physics. So you have Newtonian physics with Isaac Newton, and you have quantum physics that Einstein kind of developed, you know, the origins of that. So it doesn't mean Isaac Newton was an idiot, you know, that's what he came up with a time that expanded on that. So I think the disease model initially was, you know, a good thing to move away from this, like looking at it as a moral issue or a choice or those kind of things. But the science doesn't really say that anymore. It doesn't say that you're just born with a disease or allergy. Now, if you hear me out to conclusion, you'll understand what I'm saying. It's a neurological brain issue, but we have hardwired things um, genetically but there's also what's known as epigenetics. So in epigenetics, what that um, explains is your genes will turn on or off or express themselves based on environmental interaction. Right, see some of you nodding your heads, so you understand epigenetics. So you may have, I'm not saying there's no genetic influence, but how that gets expressed is gonna be based on the environment which triggers the emotion, which is a chemical electrical reaction that then influences that gene. So you may have a genetic vulnerability for addiction, but you grow up in a securely attached environment, you know, with nurturing, caregiving, it's unlikely for that gene to express itself in that way. You have a lower, probably, rate of addiction than somebody who had a lower genetic vulnerability and grew up around trauma, things like that. So when people would say, you know, my family's got a history of addiction, but if you really break it down, they've got a history usually of trauma, 
of um, difficulty regulating certain emotions, all that kind of stuff, or I'm the only addict in my family, but you look at the family more closely, you see the workaholic brother, the obese sister, um, you know, the in-debt cousin, whatever it may be. Because you have a family that can't provide emotionally secure attachment and regulate affect, so then you have to reach out for other things to regulate those internal states. And so then, when you're looking at things from a top-down perspective, like cognition, emotions, body, what happens is you've got um, where this, this stuff gets imprinted and mapped is subcortically in the midbrain and the lower brain. So I'm gonna get to a point here where I'm gonna show you um, a theory called uh, the triune brain theory. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with that. It uh, came out in the 60s with Paul McLean. I think that's his name, that's the next slide. So this is looking at kind of a three-layered structure to the brain. We have the reptilian brain, the uh, paleomammalian, and the <coughs> cortex. You know, kind of the base functions here, emotions, attachments imprinted in there, and then your higher thinking. Where this stuff gets imprinted, like I said, is in, a, in um, implicit memory. So explicit memory, I'm kind of going through this fast, but what I want to get to is this, this one part coming up here. Explicit memory is conscious memory. When you see images in your mind, you remember facts, that kind of thing. Then you have implicit memory, which is a felt sense in the body. So explicit memory is stored in the hippocampus. Implicit memory is in the amygdala, which as we know is also the same part of the brain that triggers fight or flight. So what happens is you get throughout development, emotions like um, Dan Siegel's work from UCLA talks about the brain nervous system being energy and information that moves around. So they have evolutionary value, adaptive value, where they give you quick information about the environment, <coughs> they give you energy to unleash an adaptive action tendency to do something about that information. So when that information can't get regulated, that energy can't get regulated, it has to get either neurologically disassociated or blocked in some way through emotional defenses. And then this is what causes all the problems, right? So if I had a dad who was verbally abusive or physically abusive, it was not safe to get angry with that, right? I mean, a lot of our clients, maybe your own personal history, I know in my childhood it blocked my anger. It was not gonna be good. So then that gets blocked. Right? And those emotions, that adaptive core anger never gets released into that action. Um, so this part of the brain where things are stored in implicit memory have no sense of time and they cannot distinguish people, time, and place. Right? And so however you would block that um, back then in childhood, right? you either tend to do that now in adulthood because you kind of disassociate into that energy. Um, or you go to the opposite of it, right? So let's say I become passive, kind of keep my head down, I don't stand up for myself, or I, you know, unleash in rage or anger or that kind of thing. So when an implicit memory is activated, and it releases all the chemical energy from that original memory, it's very dysregulated. So, when it, you can't regulate an emotion, it triggers the same survival responses as a physical danger. Which is either I'm gonna reach for attachment, I'm gonna engage in fight flight, or I'm gonna disassociate again, right? And so this is where whatever I do to start to regulate those internal states, start to cause the problems. <laughs> so memory reconsolidation is a research validated concept that shows that you can't change this stuff with a top-down approach. This is where cognitive approaches 
aren't going to shift this. So you can do all the talk therapy you want or all the cognitive therapy, and again, I'm not saying it doesn't have value. But what happens is that old memory has to be activated and then either released in the setting, like with a safe relationship or safe environment, or a new experience has to take place. So a good example of this is um, I do a therapy called Emotionally Focused Couple Therapy. If you guys are familiar with that at all, Sue Johnson. So you have to, let's say, you know, I had an um, emotionally absent parent or a critical parent or I didn't get that affirmation and I just learned to shut down and kind of dissociate. So this would probably be 80% of the men in the couples I've ever seen, right? So, correct me that said. That would be me in my, most of my relationship history. So the core thing there is shame, right? So every time, I, even though if I want to open up and I want to turn to your partner and express, you know, how I really feel, or instead of just shutting down, say I just feel like I'm failing all the time. I just feel like I can't do anything right. Right, but implicitly, the thing I learned was nobody is gonna care. No one's gonna listen to me, no one's gonna care about how I feel, and so you just kind of dissociate. So to change that, I have to feel that, not just talk about that, I just feel like I'm always failing. I have to feel that shame, turn towards your partner, have a new experience, let that experience in, which is a whole other level, to then get that to adjust, you know, the shift that, um, implicit memory into a new experience. So, which is a very difficult thing to do. <laughs> if you've ever done couples therapy, it was a challenging type of therapy there is. So there's a window there where that can happen, like in EMDR, in some of these experiential therapies, somatic experiencing, brain spotting, the brain, you know, has this ability to prepare itself, to restructure itself, once you access this implicit system. So those of you guys who do experiential therapy know what I'm talking about, where um, once you can kind of let go consciously and not think so much and get access to this, the way you access implicit memories is through a felt sense in the body. So you think of an event um, or an issue, you focus on it, you get a feeling in the body, then if you let go, this implicit system starts to take over and you, if you can keep relaxing or just letting go, you'll drop into a, a um, alpha state, brainwave-wise. You have gamma, theta, which is right now when we're talking, alpha, theta. Theta is when we uh, REM sleep or have um, you know hypnotic state. Something I think I met uh, when I was here last time, the clinical you know hypnotherapist. So when you get in this state, the brain will just take over and release this stuff in the context of a safe, supportive person, you know, us as therapists in that moment. And we'll just release these implicit memories, repair everything that will completely eradicate it from your body. So the explicit, you know, we know it has always happened. I mean, it'll be there forever. But the implicit is gone for good. If you don't do that, if you're just having a conversation, you're still so in your prefrontal cortex that you can't get access to this stuff. This is what I'm saying. So a lot of times you could be working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you're sitting in groups, and people are talking about good content, good things, but they're in their head, right? You guys know the experience is my dad molested me for 10 years straight, right? I'm talking about peanut butter and jelly, right? So if that's occurring, that nothing is gonna happen. So these therapies in the trauma field, we've been using for a long time, and they have amazing results. They're really not being applied that extensively with addiction. So what I want to show you guys is to create that change, like I said, the goal is neuroplasticity. You've got to create neurological, structural neuroplasticity, real changes in the brain and the nervous system to help people recover. Because these things are so imprinted neurochemically. Um, that you're not just going to talk therapy them away. And this is the primary reason why, you know, the stats are horrible and all that kind of stuff and they can be spun every, any which way. But, you know, I mean, what's the historical relapse rate for alcohol opiates? I mean, it's horrendous, right? 
And I'm telling you, this is the key reason. If there's no neuroplastic changes taking place in so much of therapy, because we just haven't understood it or known it. Not that we haven't had hardworking, well-intentioned, compassionate people, but we haven't been getting deep enough. You know, I mean, I've got clients that come to me 20 years sober, you know, who sponsored hundreds of people, that they still have these core issues. They're manifesting, maybe they're, you know, they're not doing heroin, they're not doing methamphetamine, but they're watching porn all the time, they're gambling. I've had so many of my male clients, you know, younger guys, I'm like, okay, if you are chain smoking, drinking five monster energy drinks, trying to have sex with every girl at the meeting, I'm sorry, but you're not shooting steroids, you're not sober, right? I mean, because they don't have this ability to regulate affect, and then these conditioned triggers, right? Every client has triggers, right? Things that get conditioned, there's Pavlovian things, which is learning. So they get imprinted with dopamine. Dopamine has high evolutionary value. You know, so anything that has high dopamine, your brain pays attention to and says, like, that's important for survival. Right? It didn't, evolution didn't count on synthetic drugs. Right? It, it just kind of threw the whole system off. It says, like, wow, that's important, keep doing more of that, or you'll die. Right? But it's associated with learning, too. So dopamine imprints this learning. So this learning system gets hijacked. And so what I'm going to show you, there's four main subcortical areas. This is the, the meat and the potatoes, what I want to talk about. That through doing EMDR, brain spotting, other therapies that I've learned um, by applying all this trauma therapy into addiction, that really for me will transform the way we're treating clients. And it's things that you can teach any therapist to do. Some of the stuff, it's like, I'm going to give you examples and stories of some of the stuff where you don't have to be an EMDR therapist, you don't have to be a brain spawning therapist. You can start to use some of these techniques right away, and maybe you're doing some of it now intuitively, and you don't even realize it. Because it doesn't matter if you got the formal training. I'm not saying to do things that you're not trained in or equipped, but I'm saying if you're in this field, I know you love people, and I know you have a level of intuitiveness that, you know, just your presence. Like, I mean, attachment is so powerful that just the presence of somebody being there, being emotionally present, will start to help restructuring your other person's nervous system. You think of, you know, people we've read about throughout history that are like highly spiritually evolved, right? And then people just want to be near them. Just because they know it's healing. Just their energy is healing. It's like, that's my highest aspiration, is to fight through all my crap to become the most loving person I can, where just, just being around people would benefit them, right? I mean, sorry, I battle my nasty ego every day trying to get there. <laughs> um, change happens rapidly in these kind of therapies. Like, when I move into these four things, um, it's mind blowing. One, there's four of these subcortical domains. The second one, I mean, these things take like one session. It's insane. And one of the great things about this, like, once you get, you know, have enough experience, get well trained enough. Because people will say, oh, you can't do EMDR, you can't do this with the person until they're like this far into treatment or they're, you know, six months a year out. That's bullshit. Like, if it's monitoring the person's window of tolerance. So, of course, I'm not going to take them into areas that they can't regulate or they're too big for them because I've had to go into so many treatment centers and, like, take six sessions to get past somebody's fear from their previous EMDR experience where somebody just flooded the hell out of them, you know? But you can, if you know how to titrate things, you know how to find their client's edge on that window of tolerance, you can take them into stuff. And these areas, this area number two, which I'm going to get into, which is so important for clearing positive using memories, I think one time out of 100, I've had that activate somebody's trauma. So it's a real safe place to go. Because if you go into these areas, like let's say somebody goes out, um, and they've got these implicit memories associated around positive experiences of using, right? Where they got that big dopamine imprint. They don't even have to know that the cue is in the environment. And it, they're just lit up, right? And now they're trying to fight off a craving. The more you fight it, the higher of sympathetic nervous activation you're gonna create until your prefrontal cortex shuts down and it's game on, right? So by clearing these things, you're giving people like the best chance to get clean, but I'm telling you, the shifts happen so rare, it's just astounding 
um, how wired to heal we are. Mm -hmm. It's insane, right? I'm sure many of you guys have experienced it. Some of you guys have been to feel a lot longer than me, you know? All right, so here's the main therapies I use that are all experiential, that um, it's kind of an integration, and I'll give some case examples of like how I do that. <coughs> Have any of you guys ever heard of this one? Okay. This for me is the, like, it. This is the baddest ass therapy out there for me. I mean, this is the number one therapy that integrates everything. So this is my foundation, and then I do everything on top of this. EMDR, brain spawning, all that kind of stuff. It's based in neuroscience, attachment theory, psychodynamic defense work. It's developed by a woman named Diana Fosha in New York City. Um, and there is nothing that will create like the safety and the rapid change. Like if you study, her book is called Transforming Power of Affect. That's kind of her, um, that's the word I'm looking for. Kind of her magnum opus of her model. It's a dense book that is gonna take you time to go through. But for me, like that's the, the best model therapy I've ever seen. And of course there's EMDR. When I first got turned into EMDR and advanced training EMDR, that was the thing that catapulted me in my understanding of implicit memory networks, which is the dominant part of the subconscious, this is what it is, is these implicit, they run the show on everything. I'm telling you, like we're conscious, research says about 1% of indirect consciousness at a time. The implicit system is in, I'm trying to run the show. Brain spotting is an evolution of EMDR that came out of that um, by a guy named David Graham. So if you do EMDR, you're familiar with EMDR, we have the bilateral stimulation in various forms, like eye movements or auditory, or whatever. Brain spotting, I would say, is a little more rapid and deep. So instead of um, bilateral stimulation, you're locking in on a position. So you might, um, how, how many of you guys are familiar with the way EMDR works, or? Feel it? Um, so you, and this is what I'm gonna explain in a second. So when you, rather than doing that, let's say you had somebody who's in a car wreck and you got PTSD from the car wreck, an EMDR, you would say, okay, pull up the image right before you knew something was gonna happen, like the oh crap moment, and focus on that. Tell me where you start to feel that in your body. Okay, it's right here, zero to 10 me, it's like a six of 10. And then you start doing eye movements with it. In brain spotting, what you would do differently is you would just come across very slowly with the pointers of your finger and say, tell me when you feel the strongest. So there's a guy, um, which I'll talk to in the fourth domain, named Robert Miller, who developed a thing called Feeling State Protocol for EMDR, which again is not used near enough, which is super powerful. So I took his and, and used brain spotting instead. And when I talk about this second domain, I mean, it is like, mind-blowing, um, but the, like I said, that's a little more focused, intense way. Sumac Experiencing by Peter Levine. Are you guys familiar with any of, any of that? Uh, sensory Motor Psychotherapy by Pat Ogden. Um, the Attachment Stuff with Emotionally Focused Couples Therapy, and then I would also say I use a lot of internal family systems or kind of known as IFS. So I would say those are the big six most research-based, impactful experiential therapies. All right, so these are the four areas for me that have to be addressed subcortically. And this is the bulk of the work here, the, the first area. Now this is gonna take time. I don't think these three even get touched in any treatment that I've seen. So a little bit of that does because of the time constraints we have with clients, right? I mean, you've got them for like a month and they've got complex PTSD or severe dissociative disorders and their life is in chaos, right? I mean, it's a lot to try to do in 30 days, right? So going back to what I was talking about earlier, when you have, you know, that dysregulated affect come up and it's going to decompensate you psychologically. So it has to be either get, the younger you are, it's probably on, always gonna go to dissociation. So your thalamus will flood with internal opiates and split off like a circuit breaker, whatever I can't regulate. And then that's gonna get stored in an implicit memory system, low and right in the brain. And that part of the brain, again, has no sense of time, can't distinguish people, time, or place. And so it's just the remotest of associations. 
will activate it in the body like it's happening right now if it was 30 years ago. But you don't see any images or have any thoughts associated with it, right? So the majority of the time, people don't know they're having an implicit memory. And not only that, but it could be activating a chain of associated memories. You get 30, 40 memories activated simultaneously. And you talk about dysregulating affect, right? If I learned in adolescence that the way to regulate that was to smoke weed, to masturbate, to drink, right? That became my learned way of regulating that affect. And no matter how much I try to do something else, at some point, I'm gonna go back to that, right? If I choose, if I, like the first client I ever worked with was a 25-year-old guy who had a heroin addiction, got clean at 18, was drinking beer, smoking weed recreationally, wasn't getting any trouble from that. His grandmother who raised him died right back to shooting heroin, right? Because he still had all this stuff in the body and hadn't learned how to regulate affect at this level, something like that's going to blow them out of the water. Anything that threatens attachment during birth up in through adolescence. Attachment is life and death, right? Because either I'm going to physically die if that you're not connected to me, or emotionally I'm going to get dysregulated, which is psychological death. So it triggers all the same defenses. Right? And so all this stuff gets split off. I mean, all of us, including me and everyone in this room, has a bunch of disassociated material. Right? The more we go to therapy, the more we work on it, the more we keep integrating. And our capacity has to be higher than our client's capacity. Otherwise, we're going to do them harm and dysregulate them. Right? I saw somebody post on LinkedIn this morning about there's no shame in going to therapy. I would say there's shame in not going to therapy. <laughs> Like, how can you espouse doing this if we don't do it, right? And man, I mean, first time I went to therapy, I had no idea I had all these issues, and I just thought, I want to be a great therapist. Right, so I'm gonna go, like, experience therapy, <laughs> and then I'm like, wow, like, boom, boom, boom. I had complex PTSD. <laughs> I had no idea, I'm just walking around dissociating all the time. <laughs> well, you know, my drug and alcohol use and all that, and doing that. And so all this stuff is like, so fragmented, right? So if there's something you don't accept about me as my caretaker or it's gonna cause you to withdraw um, love, acceptance, presence, I'll just get rid of it. A way of thinking, a behavior, a feeling, anything, I'll split off, right? So the solution is integration, but we have all this fragmented stuff. So, like I said, you can't just talk all you want and it's nice to get supported and cared for by someone, you know, us as therapists. But if you're not shifting things neurologically and creating neuroplasticity, your client is going to do what all my therapist clients do, and some other people who are in personal development, they're going to come and tell you, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I know, I know. But they're like pilots who won't land the plane. You still got to feel it. That's the hard work of therapy, it's not conversations. Therapy is an experience, not information. Right, so the only way, and your, but your system will take over and just reconstruct itself. Like if I cut my hand, I don't have to read books on cellular reconstruction and sit here with tweezers trying to put amino acids together, right? And my DNA just knows how to do it. It's the same, there is, psychology is biology. There is no psychology outside of biology. Like we are basically biologists, right? But it will take over, what the client hasn't had is our regulating presence. Like if you could put um, an infrared scan or an energy monitor or electromagnetic radiation monitor, you would see yourself absorbing energy from <coughs> the client, helping them regulate when they're in that state, holding them in that frame so then all this stuff can start to integrate and move through and reconstruct itself. And it, I mean, it's, what's amazing too is it doesn't just stop there. Of, you know, once the bad stuff gets integrated, it, explodes into the positive. It just takes off. I mean, I had a client one time where we were in treatment and his um, thing he wanted to work on was uh, his obsession with this girl that he knew was bad for his recovery. So I said, all right, focus on, you know, when you think about her and you're trying not to, I, oh no, I think I said, give me the best exciting moment you ever had with her. Okay, I can see my mind. Where do you feel in your body? Okay, it's like oh, all through here. So I started brain spotting with him. He got to a point 
where he put his legs and arms out and just started shaking. I told him, it's fine, I'm here with you, it's a normal part of the process. He started seeing images of himself as an infant being left for hours in a crib. And whether that's a constructive image for the emotions or what, I don't care. It's in his body activated, right? So I'm just holding him there and he's feeling all this stuff and finally he goes, totally relaxes. All this energy leaves that the infant had to dissociate from with a young child. And then this feeling comes over him of warmth and he goes, this is what it feels like when I feel loved by a woman. Like all from inside, right? Like there is energy and force inside of us. You can be an atheist or Christian or Buddhist, whatever. I'm telling you, it is there and it is insane. Like it will just take off once we can connect with our clients, hold them in that frame. And I know a lot of you guys do this all the time with people, you know? So this, you know, you've got to reintegrate all this stuff, which again, it's not going to happen in 30 days. This is the bulk of work. This is the long-term part of the work. So in treatment, right, I'm going to look at this and say, I got four sessions with this client. I got to triage and say, what can I work on that's going to give them the biggest bang for the buck that's going to help them integrate as much as they can before they come? Whether it's, you know, most of our clients are so fragmented, they don't have a solid sense of self, right? So they can't regulate affect. We're saying, oh, don't be codependent, don't go out there and get in a relationship for a year. And they're like, gonna fall into the abyss. And we wonder why like, they go out and hook up right away even before they do treatment and they're having sex in the bathroom. They have no sense of self, they have no ability to regulate affect, most of them, right? So, but you gotta start to identify these things and I'm telling you, you can get so much more work done using these experiential therapies. Like, I'm trying, the hardest thing for me to do is get people to do nothing to get them to stop talking so much, because you want them to feel heard. But they're just, that's part of the defense a lot of times too, is they're just gabbing away, right? Especially when they get near emotion. It's just like, da, 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 da. Any questions on this part or comments or feedback from me or everybody understand what I'm saying there? This is a lot of the work you guys do already. Okay? All right, so this area right here, in, Implicit memories, like positive using experiences, get in, in, they get embedded just like a trauma because they're so intense, and they get put in that same part of the brain where, again, you can get a felt sense memory, but you don't know you're having a memory, right? They're just craving that. The body wants that feeling, that sensation, because they learned like this is important for survival. So the way I treat these, and then the conditioned stimuluses that go with them. So through a felt sense in the body, so you get activated to this. So, and then what happens is the brain will put positive euphoric memories in one network, and it'll put um, negative consequences in another network, and they're not linked. So what'll happen is the client will get the euphoric memory, right, of how awesome the heroin felt to shoot, or smoke meth, or whatever it was, have sex with the prostitute, <coughs> But they don't pull in any negative consequences, right? So they can get all, start getting all dissociated and loopy and, and dopamine, norepinephrine, just flooding them. So the way I work with this is I'll give you an example of um, one girl I treated where I said, okay, give me the best high music was on acid that you've ever had. It could be the first time you IV shot heroin. Pull it up in your mind, focus on that image. And then tell me when you start to feel something here now in your body. And typically, it's pretty intense, seven or eight, nine out of 10, 10 out of 10 for her was a 10. And she's just like, okay, so I go all over here. So in brain spotting, I just take the point I come across and I say, okay, tell me when you feel that the strongest. Right there, right there. And you just, again, same thing like EMDR, you let go, you start focusing on that spot. Typically what the, will happen is the brain will see some positive images of that memory, go to other pleasurable using memories, start to make this turn into negativity. The positive implicit memories will discharge from the body permanently forever. It now links it to all this negative consequence stuff. And if you stay with it long enough to get through that process, it will typically start going to um, positive future stuff, like going back to college, getting married, having a baby, becoming a fireman, whatever it may be. And if, I'm not saying a word influencing this in any way. This is the brain doing this all on its own. 
So with that particular girl, she went from a 10 shaking, was gonna AMA, so they asked me to sit down and with her. We did that using memory. I bring them back around, go back to using memory, maybe it's a three now, we do the same loop. We do that until it's a sustained zero. So it's try as hard as you can to bring a positive feeling, any sensation, nothing. What would you like to believe now when you think about that event? It disgusts me. Her exact words were, I think for the first time in my life, I'm gonna get clean. Another kid came to me during a break a group and he said, um, Every time I see a pen, I get triggered. Because I used to snort coke and meth off a pen all the time, pen cap. Right, so he's like, I, there's pens everywhere in treatment center. <laughs> so I, that's the condition trigger, right? Another result of learning. So we did the same thing with brain spotting. Halfway through the brain spotting, his eyes pop out and he goes, it's just a pen. It's just a pen. So he breaks the neurological subcortical link. So imagine people come out of treatment, no matter how much hard work they've done, all this is still in the brain of their body. Every associated cue that's Pavlovian, every pleasure we're using memory. And remember, the brain, what's our first priority as a human being? It's to survive. Whether it's rational or irrational, if the brain says I need this to survive, it is gonna either bypass or shut down your prefrontal cortex. You know, and the smarter you are, the worse it is. I know, what is wrong with me, right? So you shame the hell out of yourself. But I mean, it's a subcortical thing. It'll blow over the prefrontal every time, right? And if you look at, I mean, how many of your clients are so sincere, right? I'm gonna lose my kids, my career, my life. But then drop a hat, I'll hit the gas and I'll run my whole life without even thinking about it. That is irrational, right? So you know it's not coming from the rational part of the brain. But that's the way this part of the brain works, right? It's aberrant learning. If you look at this third area, it's around attachments. Everybody knows about, you know, ambivalent attachment, avoidant attachment, disorganized attachment, all these kind of things, right? What are they? They're coping mechanisms. They're adaptions to attachment failures. And where do they come from? They get imprinted in memory. They're driven by implicit memories, right? They're learning. So you go leave treatment again and if I can't regulate affect, I need you to help me regulate affect. But if I can't connect to you, if I put up, you know, somatic walls, even if I want to connect to you, I can't. I can't regulate affect. Right? So now I'm going to go out here. My only shot is to develop secure connections with other people, but I can't do it neurologically. Right? Now to do this, like an emotionally focused couple therapy, this takes time. But this is a time an addict don't have. <laughs> right? I'm a walking relapse 24-7, you know? With my couples who aren't addicted, I mean, it take me six months, a year, maybe longer, because most couples I work with end up having all kinds of trauma, <laughs> right? So their cycles go at light speed. It's the same process that I'm doing here, here, here. So I'm taking things like ADP, brain spotting, EMDR, and through images, your brain does not know real from non-real when it sees an image in your mind. It's directly connected to your emotions. That's why we cry in movies, get scared in movies, and it's really happening, right? You can start to work, even now while you're in treatment, and start to work on these through a felt sense in the body, getting them connected to this, and starting to clear these old attachment patterns, so then they can start to imprint new patterns. So all the new learning we're trying to create for them of you know, healthier ways to connect with people, new ways to regulate their affect. If the old stuff is still imprinted subcortically, that stuff is like either not gonna take hold or it's gonna take forever to take hold. Because it's so deeply embedded. Like when you look at attachment too, a big part of attachment is oxytocin. So when you connect to your mom as an infant or a child, you get opioids, you get that warm, safe sensation but it releases oxytocin, and what that does is it creates memories around who that person is. So these old psychoanalytical theories were correct, they didn't know the neurochemistry behind it, but that's why you're drawn, if your attachment figure was all messed up and inconsistent and all this stuff, that's why on a neurochemical level you're drawn to those type of people, because that's what your memory system, your attachment system is familiar with. So you just can't override that, right? Or it's, again, it takes forever. 
And if you're, you know, Tom and Sally and you're not addicts, okay, eventually we'll get there. But if I need to stay connected to people to regulate myself, I don't have time for that. Right? So you can get in, I don't see, I've never seen anybody use like EMDR brain spawning for this. And this is huge. And it's, I mean, it, this is so important. Like everybody knows in the, what was it, 50s or whatever when they did the, um, the pleasure centers in the brain with the dopamine and all that stuff, the rats who would hit the bar until they like gave a food water <coughs> and died, right? So this guy came out in the 2000s and um, he had a, a, a novel idea that sounds very simplistic. So he said, is coke that good or does the rat's life suck that bad? <laughs> so they did an experiment. They built a cage that was 200 times the size of the rat cage. They put in a bunch of securely attached rats who got licked by their mother when they were infants. They put in all kinds of foliage, created a rich environment, and you know pictures of nature. They put cocaine and heroin addicted rats in there. They didn't want anything to do with the drugs. As a rat, they call it like rat park or something like that, right? So. If you think like some of our clients, right? Some, I mean, if you were fortunate to have loving friends and family members, but most of them just got mounds of dysfunction, right? They got horrible attachment histories. They're all fragmented in pieces. Their environments are a wreck, right? Life sucks. If life sucks, getting high is not such a bad option, right? And if that's the way I learned through development to deal with how bad life sucks, it's hard to break away from that because it's chemically imprinted in my subcortical brain. You guys follow me so far? Right? So once I started to realize all this stuff, and I'm not saying I'm a genius or anything, I created all this stuff, I just found a way to put it together for me. I was like, oh my God, like this is it. This is why people can't get sober. Right? Is we gotta address it, especially in treatment. Like you will get more work done in the amount of time doing this, these um, experiential therapies than anything else. Those of you who, EM, who do EMDR, you know you can get stuff done in one EMDR session that would take you six months to a year trying to accomplish and talk therapy. Like, I've had so many of my clients that I've had those kind of sessions with, with EMDR, and they're like, why doesn't every therapist do EMDR? I'm like, I don't know. And you, again, it's the system. There's multiple ways to get into the system. I'm not saying you guys all have got to do EMDR, or any other modalities, or tap into the system. It doesn't matter how you get there. But it's like, we have to create neuroplasticity, we have to shift things so accordingly. This works with people, too. One of my clients uh, relapsed on opiates, he had a high level executive sales position. His wife found out, you know, he came clean, they were working on the marriage, I was in couples therapy with him. But he said, when I did my individual session with him, he said, look, I want to save my marriage, but I can't stop obsessing about this other woman. You know, I just like, so I said, all right, give me the best sex you ever had with her. And he's like, all right, we had an industry trade show in Vegas. We went there, got this hotel. It's like, all right, you see that in your mind, the moment that's the most intense, the most erotic. Yes, where you feel like your body. It's like an eight to 10 right here. Started brain spotting with them. Again, just clear all that implicit positive sensation out of the body. It just starts going to like his kids, his wife, feelings of guilt, all this stuff. Cleared it. At the end of the session, he says, I don't even know what I ever saw in it. Like, I know this stuff sounds like almost BS, like it's too good to be true, but I, I thought the same thing myself until I started doing it. I've done it with thousands of clients now over the last 12 years. It is like insane. So going back to Robert Miller, the fourth area, is he, he's the one who developed this thing, the feeling state protocol. So I kind of hijacked that and did my brain spotting thing with it right here. His theory is that we have core survival needs as human beings, like the need to feel safe, connected, belong, um, to have agency, to feel alive, to have significance. And there'll be a deficit in that need. And then the first time we get it met at the highest felt sense, whatever did that, whether that's a person, a drug, or a behavior, will fuse um, subcortically and link that. You know, in, in neuroscience, have expression neurons that fire together, wire together, and it will not unlink it subcortically. 
This is why, like, if any of you guys do a couple of relationship therapy, you can have somebody that has a two month relationship that takes them five years to get over it. Because it's not the other person, it's that they just met that need at a level they never got to met. And that's what they're stuck on in grieving, where they just, that part of them can't let it go. So, cortically, I can learn new things. Like, a good example is I felt like a loser my whole life. I go to Hog Rock this weekend, I get a big pot. Everybody's cheering me on, I feel special, unique, and now I can't stop compulsive gambling. I'm losing my business, my marriage, but I can't stop compulsive gambling, right? Because it's linked to a core survival need to feel significant. So again, and I trained with Robert Miller, it's nuts, like, you get connected to the felt sense of that. So sometimes, if you can, I like to get the first time they ever felt that, or, one of the most recent intense ones. And then I'll do EMDR brain spotting and one session you'll break that connection. And now their subcortical brain can learn new ways to get that need met. And a lot of times what'll happen is it'll just automatically drop into um, the wound, right? Feeling like a loser, getting neglected by my dad and telling me I was never enough. All that, and you just process that from that point. But for me, you know, again, some of these things are unique. I feel fortunate and grateful. When I worked at an agency, I couldn't afford to do a lot of these trainings. So I get that, you know, as I got into private practice and stuff like that, and I was able to do well enough for myself where I could start investing in all these trainings. My thing is I would just like to give everything I know to you guys for, for free. Because I want you to help people, and you guys are passionate about helping people, and I'm like, Ask me anything when we do the Q&A. They set scenarios up with your clients. Like I do consultation. Any of you guys can reach out to me at any point. John H at gatewaycounseling.com. You can email me at nauseum. I give my cell number. Talk to me. I just want to see people get better. That's what I've done in my life, just like you guys. Um, proud to be among you. But for me, like this is so crucial. In my private practice, I can do all this. Right, my clients, most of them, are stable enough, and we do this work, and I'm telling you, it's like, it goes from a 10% you know, sobriety rate to like a 90% sobriety rate. Because once you clear here, it's clear. It's, it's good. Like, I, I don't know how many of you guys have experienced actually doing some of this stuff yourself, I can tell you it's like, mind-blowing sometimes. I mean, in my most powerful sessions, like, even how my brain will create images to create the experience to heal. Like a, a woman I work with where uh, we were working on these explosions she would get with her husband, and he was, he got enough. He's like, that's the last one. Like, one more I'm out. And so she went through a lot of physical and emotional abuse with her mother. So we talked into this nine-year-old memory where her mother punched her in the eye and broke her blood vessels. And it was a month and a half of doing EMDR is that one memory would lead to all these associated memories of being abused. In the last session, during one of the sets, tears started running down her eyes, and I said, what are you noticing? So my mom's picking me up, holding me, telling me she's sorry, and attending to me. Right, and again, I'm not setting that, or hiding her through the injury. This is her own brain creating the healing experience she needs. Because in that memory system, it doesn't matter whether it's real or unreal. Right, you got the corrective experience, it goes back in here as a real live event. If your cortical brain knows, oh, that's my session was gone, but where it matters, it says, I got the better outcome. Like, we're just wired to self-correct. I tried to do it in the beginning, so you didn't know it was kind of all over the place. <laughs> so I had to scrap the PowerPoint. That probably be the last time I ever tried to follow the PowerPoint. You guys saw it, you were here. Part of the history. All right, my new obsession, and I'm going to give you what the relevance is for addiction with this flow stakes. So I have a podcast I do on peak performance called The Key with a partner of mine, 
And my passion as a little kid was, and an adolescent was to help other people achieve their dreams. So I'm sure some of you guys in this room have some of that same passion. Um, flow states are an altered state of consciousness on a neurochemical and anatomical level that will unlock your highest potential you'll ever experience as a human being. Not exaggerating. And, I mean, spiritually, performance, everything, and I'm going to explain why. I'm going to explain the relevance to addiction here. It's people who achieve the most flow states in their life, test as the highest level of fulfillment and happiness of anybody else, and have the lowest rates of addiction. Because they're getting high. <laughs> now there's a dark side to flow that you can end up using it like an addiction and chasing it like an addiction. So, another great accomplishment of my life is learning how to pronounce this man's name. Being high, chicks at me high. <laughs> and I won't tell you the acronym I use, which I the mnemonic can remember that. But. All right, so flow state, the original thing was identified by Abraham Maslow, which you guys are familiar with, Maslow Hyper Needs. He called them peak states or peak experience. Tony Robbins called them peak states. Um, in the 90s, there was a, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi was a Hungarian psychologist, he researching happiness. And in his research and interviews with thousands of people, what he, people kept using this term flow. It just flowed, right? It's like being in the zone as an athlete, right? I was like scoring 100 points I couldn't miss. Spiritually, it's like I became one with the universe. Right? You, I mean, we've all experienced these states in different ways at different levels of intensity. Be in a conversation with somebody for like, you know, hours and you're just absorbed for like 15 minutes. Or you have an amazing experience. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen YouTube Live, man, but it's like, to have 70,000 people with that kind of positive energy is like a positive experience for me anyway. Um, um, so what happens in flow? So in the why it gives you these experiences. So in flow, what happens is parts of your prefrontal cortex shut down. And these parts are associated with impulse control, self-doubt, self-consciousness. So you are completely outside of yourself. You have no fear of failure, no self-doubt. The part that is creative goes hyperactive. And so you're just all intuitive, innovative. You don't have time to think, right? It's just happening. The parts that experience time and space in your brain aren't localized because it takes so much to create those experiences, but those parts get really shut down. So when you're in a full-blown flow state, you lose, you get what's called time dilation. Either it speeds up or slows down. So let's say you're doing something athletically and it's like you're in the matrix, right? It's like everybody's moving and you're just, you, your brain recognizes patterns and you see things before they happen. You're just like, you can't miss can't lose, right? If you're, again, you know, losing track of time, you know, profound experience could be in nature, could be in you know, love making, whatever it is, right? You're just fully immersed. And then that part that is the boundary between me and this chair and me and you shuts down. So you literally become one with everything. So you could take 20 years of meditation to get there, or flow state could put you there in 30 seconds. So there's ways to coach, you know, it was, it was thought that it was just this like gift from the gods that people experience once in their career or every so often, but then they, for 20 years now, they've been researching it through neuroscience and everything, trying to understand like what it actually is and what creates it. So in the brain also, the entry point is fight or flight. So you get that adrenaline, right? So the people who are really like adrenaline athletes and performance, you know, all this kind of stuff, they don't chase adrenaline. A lot of them in interviews say they hate it. They're like, I can't stand that feeling. Um, a great book to like learn about all this stuff is called The Rise of Superman by Stephen Kotler. He's the one that kind of has popularized it now, past Chick Sent Me High. So once you let go, like so we all learn, right? So if you see, um, <laughs> I'll take myself as an example. So beginning this talk, I'm like trying to figure out how to do a PowerPoint and I'm fumbling about and I'm like, I can't find my rhythm, it's not me, right? And I'm like getting more and more nervous, and I'm like, all right, screw this. <clears throat> I'm just gonna turn around and start talking, that's what I do. So then what happens is your brain floods with nitrous oxide, calms, flushes all that cortisol. Then it jacks up dopamine and norepinephrine, which gives you a massively rapid processing speed. It releases opioids, 
right, which takes away pain, calmness. It releases an andamine, which is the, the main neurotransmitter you get in cannabis, and then serotonin. So you're getting heroin, coke, pot, and ecstasy <laughs> all at the same time, right? Because they're pretty intoxicating high, right? So, but it's very depleting, right? So look at like the difference between when I started this talk and how I feel now, right? It's that, but the way you tap into that, so it has four phases. It's um, struggle, right? Whether that's a long-term years of learning a skill or trying to get going and then release where you just let go and you trust, right? You trust like the training you put in or whatever you have to communicate. Then you go into a full-blown flow state and then there's like a recovery period. So, like I said, people, if you look, there's also research around um, dopamine levels with addiction. So, let's say a baseline dopamine is like 100 units of dopamine for the average person. And then you use, you know, cocaine and it takes you to three or 500, or meth takes you to 1,500. Well, you keep doing that over time or years, right? You don't come back to baseline, you come below baseline. And this is post acute withdrawal, right? It takes time for the brain to reset itself. Now, some of that stuff, according to some research, doesn't, right? So if you've been a long-term chronic addict um, using specific types of substances, you might not fully get back to the baseline. So there's gonna be times where maybe you, you struggle more, than, or maybe it was that way before, chicken and egg, right? I think for me, working with a lot of sexual trauma and sexual issues, um, I haven't seen a ton of research on this, but I believe if you were exposed pre-puberty to sexually stimulating things, I think it really affects your dopamine system. It's like a child in eight ball, and it, it hits those receptors so hard. So you're, like, you're kind of a, underneath that line, so you want to feel good, right? You're, you're gonna be drawn to things that give you dopamine, whether it's sex, risk-taking, other kind of stuff like that. You can see too, like let's say, I mean I like to use more holistic approaches if, if possible, nutritional supplements, things like that. For some clients who need a medication, but there's no illness there or other things. But I mean even if clients I've had in the past who've gone on Wellbutrin and they were struggling with porn, and it wasn't like super severe, and they're like, once I got on it, I had no cravings to watch porn. So in that case you just see it, I mean they're just craving dopamine. So it, I think it's important to teach people, I mean you guys have um, this like adventure program here, right? Rebound. Rebound, right? So stuff like that is important, man, right? To teach people how to feel good. It's also part of that new learning, right? So if we're wiping out that old negative implicit learning, you've got to imprint new learning only through experience, right? I mean, when you see people trying to recover and you tell them all these things that they could do, eh, eh, Right, they, they just, like, it doesn't hit the dopamine farm. They're just like, theoretically, like, you've gotta get them doing it, right? You gotta get them experience. Experience is the only thing that changes things, never insight information. Maybe it's a good thing to have awareness, but you've gotta have experience. Um, Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. I'm sorry. Um, the, when you do, say you do EMDR with somebody who has the trauma, at the young age, the sexual trauma, like at that, at that threshold that you said was a little bit too soon, and you do the EMDR and you do the brain spotting, is the baseline still under after after you do the EMDR and the brain spotting? For like if they have the um, dopamine you're saying? Uh, right, what you were saying about the dopamine and their baseline. So it, it, I guess what I'm asking is, does the EMDR and the brain spotting um, eradicate that or fix that problem? Um, I don't think or will the baseline always be under? I think the base, in some cases, the baseline would be under what I would say where it would be a positive shift is what happens, right, when you have to disassociate to survive trauma. So your nervous system over-regulates parasympathetically. And so then when you release that trauma and you take that off, it shifts people's energy way up. You know, like people will have real visceral, visceral experiences and they feel much more energized. Because a lot of times, let's say, and it doesn't have to be significant, what we would consider significant trauma. You know, the best definition I've ever heard of trauma is by Anna Fosha, who created ADP. Unwanted and overwhelming emotions in the face of loneliness or helplessness. <coughs> right? So that's very comprehensive, especially in childhood, right? As I'm developing, if my parasympathetic system gets too chronically activated, shame will shut that down too, trauma, dissociation. So then it's like my energy is going to be low. 
Um, I know it's not maybe a direct <laughs> response to what you're saying, but if it was a neurochemical thing um, from getting overly stimulated with dopamine, I don't see the direct, like with processing trauma, the like where directly raised dopamine, but if it releases the overregulation, it's definitely going to lift energy. Um, one more thing, and then we'll get to the Q and A. You guys can keep class. So the other thing is balance. You know, one of the things I'm doing with Jason, we have a company we just launched called Neuralize Solutions, and you know we're doing all this kind of stuff that I'm showing here, but we're working with a functional medical doctor, getting everybody <coughs> blood work done not just for their metabolics and liver and all that stuff, but genetics, hormone levels. I think most of us have never been balanced in our life, right? I mean, dietarily, there's so much research coming out constantly about food and behavior and mood, right? I mean, what does every addict do when they come to treatment? Chain smoke, <coughs> coffee, sugar, right? Which is gonna impede them healing, it's gonna prolong post-acute withdrawal quite a bit, and it's still sending their system like this, and they can't manage this, right? So they any anything they feel, they want to change it. They don't know how to regulate states. So that's a really important part, but when people get balanced, you feel good. Like for years, I struggled with chronic fatigue since I met, maybe in the high school, early 20s. That's why I love stimulants. It was not so I could like sit around and like look at the blinds and see if anyone's coming to get me, but it was just to give me energy. I was like, oh, I feel good, I have energy. Yes, <laughs> right? And then so giving that up, it's like, oh. Then I'm doing coffee and energy drinks and all this crap or medications. But the problem is I had like no testosterone. You know, so once I got that address, it was like, oh my God, after like three weeks of treatment of that, it was like, is this how everybody else feels? I just don't feel tired all the time. I just have to be being tired all the time. And then it affects everything, right? Fatigue. So people have all kinds of deficiencies out and around these gut stuff. I mean, right, everybody's seeing more and more research coming around. You know, like for me, medical and mental health are so primarily focused on symptom suppression. Because there is a lot of freaking money in medications. And I'm not a conspiracy therapist, good, good God. Like every day on LinkedIn, I see another thing come out about stuff that would get marketed, pop-up screens for physicians, promoting opioids the last 10, 15 years. I mean, you're talking billions and billions of dollars, right? And then if you have insurance, I can get an $8 copay for, for an antidepressant or some other thing where I can spend 150 bucks on supplements, especially for clients coming out, like let's say they got insurance, but they don't have a lot of cash flow. And so once they have treatment, it's like, I, I you know, can't get that. I can get all those drugs. I can come with money for that, but you know. Um, so this is for me an essential part. It's probably, again, one of the most overlooked parts in recovery is health and wellness. You know, I mean, it is not given, like, most places I've worked, it's like, if you were have the means, you get to meet with a nutritionist, nobody else. I mean, part of the reason I'm here too is, I think you guys do an awesome job here. Like, I'm so fed up with this industry. I've almost quit this industry so many times like just disgusted with it. I don't want to work with addiction at all. I've had it, the scumbag halfway house owners, the client brokering, people coming in stealing other clients, people don't want to get clean, just disgusting stuff, insurance. I mean, the only thing keeps bringing me back is clients, right? It's like people need help. 750,000 people died of overdoses and something like that. I mean, it's, it's like, but I will not align myself with anybody. I've just had it, you know? But that's why I love coming here, is I met John, he showed me around here, and I'm like, my passion is I want to be a part of changing the way we do treatment globally. I cannot do that, I'm not big enough to do that. But I want to align myself with many people who have that same vision and who are doing the right thing to make real change, because people are dying. If they don't die, their lives are getting ruined. Right? And we've got to get, like, I can't tell you how many times, like, if I start talking about this stuff, I just get tomatoes and eggs thrown at me. Like, you guys are a kind <laughs> crowd. <laughs> you know? It's just, yeah, but, uh, 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 you know, like, so 
sorry, whatever. Like, you can disagree with anything I say, I'm fine with that. I want to come from a place of love. I'm never going to debate and argue. But it's like, this stuff works, it makes sense. It's got science behind it. You know, it's so individualized when you look at those oxytocin imprints and the implicit learning and how your brain gets restructured more anatomically. It is unique to you. Like, you cannot have a cookie cutter approach to treatment. You've got to stop trying to get everybody else sober the way you got sober. Right? And you guys are in the field. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Right? You know about how the field is. You know about how the industry is. You know about how people in recovery are. Like, I'm not here to pose anything on anybody. I'm just saying, like, if you find any value in this, if you want any help from me, this is what I got to offer. I'm learning all the time. I have no loyalty to nothing but truth. I'll dump EMDR, I'll dump brain spot, I don't care. I just like after the truth and helping people. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs>
I wanted her, like I felt sense in the body of how she experienced my empathy and care for her. So I think, like my experience is you can be in, uh, a lot of people I've worked with in AA, one downside, and again, people aren't professionally trained, is that you can stay in your head, talking and filling out worksheets and all this kind of stuff. And again, I'm not saying any antagonist against AA or doesn't have value, because I'm sure as hell not gonna answer the phone at three in the morning. Right? <laughs> your sponsor needs to do that, right? But I think if you focus on experience, there's ways you can kind of help people do that and realizing that some of the benefits they could get by relationship, community, and take it to another level, it could be even more effective. But I do see that, like I've had um, so many people I've worked with who've been to like Patrick Carnes, a renowned sex addiction therapist, and then when I start working with them, they, have, they don't know their emotion from their elbow. Or they're just filling out worksheets and stuff. Yeah. Uh, fascinating, uh, what they say, no bucks, no bucks, no bucks. Um, clearly, a lot of the stuff that you talked about was way over my head, but I found it incredibly fascinating to kind of follow it. And there was some kind of logic, even from like a 50,000 foot level, looking down where the conversation took place. But what I found interesting in the conversation was there were there were really two pieces of it. So there was a very, there was a piece that talked about emotions and feelings and experience and connection. And then there was a very high power sleep car part that was about, you know, modalities that you can use to make changes with, within the brains and things of that sort. And I only bring it up because, um, so my work is more experience based than anything else. I'm a recovery alcoholic and works with, with typically people with, you know, a high net value worth that um, have a difficult time grasping some of the elements that other people in AA grasp. Mm -hmm. And I found that a lot of things that you said in terms of having that value of having that connection piece, because it's an interesting dynamic when you take someone from a group setting and you work with them on a one-on-one -on -one, um, relationship, because then you can you can kind of think about how they're seeing the what, what you're what you're talking to about mm -hmm. them. And I kind of got the sense from you that from your work you saw there was you know there was real value. Um, in doing that kind of work at that emotional level that's experiential for the client. Is that, is, is that yeah. somewhat accurate? Yeah. And I think um, there's a guy um, named Phil Flores from Atlanta who's written a good book um, called Addiction as an Attachment Disorder. And it's probably one of the best books I've read, uh, read on the integration of therapy and AA. And he talks, showing some of the therapeutic aspects that can be had in a 12-step program. One of them is like, okay, a lot of these wounds are very relational, right? So people have really wounded me, people close to me, could be parents, could be whoever. So it's really hard to open up the trust, right? So you kind of box into a corner where I don't, one of the things that AA can mitigate in that regard is I don't just have to trust you, I can like diversify that amongst the whole group. So it's like a little less scary to trust the group than one intimate person. Plus if you're my sponsor, you need me too. Right, it's not just me fully trusting you, but like you, you need me to stay sober yeah. as well. Yeah. Right, so I think that's a way also that you can kind of blend the two. But I think, uh, I mean, that's the evidence really is it's all the cross addictions and cross compulsions. You know, I mean, I can't tell you how many guys I've worked with five years clean who came down here for treatment, put their life together. Um, have built businesses, make more money than they ever thought they would, have a girlfriend, and they're ready to kill themselves. <coughs> and it's the same issue every time. They have still so much shame, they can't deeply connect with other people on an intimate level, through, because it's unprocessed trauma, shame, whatever. And so once you buy all the jet skis and the, go to the strip clubs and all these things you gotta do, you stimulated yourself enough, there's, okay, what now? I thought this stuff would fill me, and then, I've done everything and I'm not going to go back to drugs and I'll once that tore my life up but then because without deep connection what's the point right I mean life I don't want to watch the sunset by myself every day yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, yeah, I, love that. I, I want to thank you because now I truly believe that I need months and months of training and certification <laughs> but it's, while I'm building up that, that budget for my trainings how do I help them achieve this without EMDR, without brain spotting, and those things I have to train for that? 
I would say that's for me why I love ADP because it can go as deep, like I'll never stop playing ADP. But I can show people in an hour massive amounts of stuff that they can apply right now that can totally transform the way they work with clients. Because the essence of it is so simple. And I have a lot of clients that are minor therapists. And so showing that, giving them some like guidance in that can really equip you. Because I mean, if you're like me, you go through six and a half, seven years of school and you get in your first session, you have no idea what to do. And it's funny because sometimes I trip over it. The other day I was working with someone who has had a lot of trauma and trying to help her sleep, I kind of did a body scan meditation with her. And that session was like incredible. She started like making connections and to the point where she said, yeah, when I'm at a party and I can't remember someone's name, I see that gun in my face. I yeah. went, wow. And then she told me about a rape and what she remembered was hands and she'd started collecting hands and I went said to her, well what would happen if you just that first bunch of hands that you bought for like a dollar at the flea market, what would happen if you took a hammer to them? She went like, she absolutely froze. I said, okay, I know from now on we're going to start with the meditation at the beginning of every session. You know, so I know sometimes I'm tripping on it, but I want to make that connection of bringing that, that positive uh, yeah. energy to her as well. Yeah, so your presence, right, your energy, if you look at like an emotion, it's like a wave, right? So here comes the energy that is evolutionary wired in for an adaptive purpose, the wave gets blocked for being dysregulated, I've got to develop defensive strategies. Mm -hmm. So our ultimate goal is to a secure attachment to help them connect with that wave and let it come all the way through regulated to unlock their full capacities now. Not just get rid of the trauma, but to unleash their, their full capabilities. So we are the glue that holds that together, and then you're just titrating it, right, a little at a time. So if you think of an upside down triangle, okay. at the bottom you have an emotion that is very dysregulating for the client. If they start to feel it, even if they're not conscious of it, they're going to get some form of anxiety and then engage in some defense. And this could be a thousand things, right, from heroin to switching the subject. So then when somebody walks in the door, I'm, this triangle is over their head for me. And I'm looking to fill that triangle out as fast as I can. And now I know, like let's say somebody comes in, they say they're depressed. I have no reason to be depressed, blah, blah, blah. So I just started asking them curious questions. I have no idea why they're depressed. And I noticed in the course of my exploration, they say twice they talked about their husband seemed being so demeaning to them. The first time they self-attacked and the second time they rationalized. So I'm just going to point that out and say, you know, when you talk about your husband being so shaming to you, the first time you beat yourself up, the second time you make excuses. I know they should be feeling a level of anger. So I, there we go, identify the bottom of the triangle. So now I know I've got it somewhere they had to block that that was very good to do, right? And they don't really feel any shame about that. But now I know that's one thing i got to flag to help them get connected to their core anger, which has a lot of strength. The caveat I would say, you know, because when I was in college, I'm very analytical and intellectual, so I was a big CBT person until I started working with people. <laughs> but I know like here you guys do DBT, right? The difference with DBT is the mindfulness component. So because these clients have little to nil capacity to regulate affect. So they've got, that's the foundation, everything I do, the foundation is mindfulness. Like, tracking that felt sense in the body, so they have to develop somatic awareness, and then they have to tolerate it. So that, that's where those DBT skills come in, so it's not just cognitive, it's not CBT. Right? It has elements of that, but it brings in, so for me it's a great transitional step into the deeper experiential therapies that they're doing at this level, that then they can kind of move in, so you can integrate them really nicely, but then that's the, so then you identify every defense is anxiety driven even if the client doesn't consciously feel anxiety, because it goes, they could be right at the fence before there's recognition of affect. I had a dollar for every time a client said to me, oh, no, no, it's not that, it's not the trauma. I, I handled that years ago. Anybody that tells you they dealt with it, didn't deal with it. <laughs> I've never heard one time somebody who dealt with it say they dealt with it. They will give you a cohesive narrative of how they did it. I, I tell people, I said, I know it sounds like you're feeling this way because there's a duck outside, but, yeah, what right. happened 30 years ago is important. So you know that they have high anxiety if they're giving these statements like that. 
Yeah. They can be sincere. Maybe they did do some work. But you know, like, okay, I don't want to just <laughs> shove them in. I've got it, that window tolerance is one of the best concepts ever. So above the window is hyper arousal. I'm getting too anxious. Below is hypo. I'm like spacing, dissociating, disconnecting. So those are your metrics to slow down, get back in the window, which may take multiple sessions or building up capacity. Maybe the window comes in like this, so you're growing. Like so, when I subcontracted and did EMDR at all kinds of treatment centers, I might do five sessions where I don't do EMDR. I got to build safety with this woman who just met me, who got sexually assaulted by a man, who doesn't know me from anything, and is terrified of men. And I'm just gonna like, okay, let's set up the EMDR protocol and start going to town, you know, like. And I want to start using some of those same skills, like I would use them in AEP or if you guys DBT, however you do it, to start building her affect tolerance up, right? And I may never do bilateral stimulation with her whole time she's in treatment. But I've had other women I walked in and like met them on the spot and we processed the rape the first time I met them. So those clients shouldn't be withheld healing and treatment because there's a blanket rule about, well, you can't take clients to trauma and treatment. That would be true of some, but not all. Uh, thank you so much for coming in. Um, I was talking about with uh, a new friend today, we were talking like, I was doing Brene Brown stuff before I knew about Brene Brown, and so I just didn't know that label, and now I'm like learning about subcortical before. So I was doing stuff, but I didn't know the language, right? Yeah. I did EMDR, and I had this, I didn't know what was going on, and all of a sudden, I was in a safe spot, right? What other, besides the ones that you've used, what other, because you just mentioned DBT as works hand in hand with what you're talking about, what other, because you know, I've met some acupuncturists, I've met some people that, are, that regu regulate the diet, what else, what other modalities or therapies have you seen really go coming hand in hand with some of this uh, belief systems yet? My first response would be anything that works. Yeah. <laughs> but I, once you understand the neurology of this, then you're wide open. Like, I never do the EMDR protocol, right? I mean, for me, I mean, I learned it when I learned EMDR, but for me, like, forgive my expression, it's like putting on a condom. You, like, I'm, the emotion is up, and then you set up this whole protocol, and they lose their emotion. You know, I wouldn't offend anyone. <laughs> you are a fanatic, so I'm hoping that you're a little more. It's a flow state. You're in a flow state. I'm in a flow state, watch out, right? But, Anything, once you understand how the system works, then you can get in there any way that you that you know is gonna impact that. Some people, like I said, I have a friend of mine who is one of the best Tulsa people I've ever seen in my life. We used to co-lead groups together, and so we integrated him and me. And a couple times he was like, when I first met him, I'm like, man, I don't know, like, should I go back to school? And I was like, don't ever go to school. It would ruin what you have, <laughs> right? But, um, like, let's say, I don't know if you're saying this, but like, so my friends did the acupuncture a few times with our, you know, guy that we work with. It is open in these energy channels, right? And she's got, you know, a significant trauma history and everything. And so the first time she did acupuncture and he left her in there, she like wept for 20 minutes, not knowing why, right? Same thing will happen in EMDR, other therapies or ADP, where all this affect comes up and releases. So if you look at, like, in, um, Yoga, they have a concept known as samskaras, which really are implicit, frozen implicit memories. So there's, you know, there's things from thousands of years ago where people were tapped into this. So for me, like, I don't care what verbiage or syntax you use or what the modality designation is, but once you, it's like, I mean, there's so much leeway, like, because we're innately wired to do this, you know? So for me, like, you know, things like acupuncture, um, you know, hypnosis can, I use elements of it, you can get somebody in the window of tolerance that way, and then do processing, different things like that. But, um, some, again, some people are just like being present, right? I mean, that's the thing I would tell every therapist, is to let go of like, I don't have all the answers, I don't know it all, I don't know whether somebody should get divorced or not, I'm not gonna tell them that, I can tell them whether the relationship's healthy or not, but it's really, the presence, like words usually screw it up. You know, we don't have to have the right thing to say. Take that pressure off yourself. You know, like, I'm so glad I cut that loose and I got help training through that. It's, you're, it's the right brain to right brain attunement. You know, like I had a client of mine whose dad died over the weekend a couple years ago and she was a therapist and everybody was telling her, you're so strong, 
uh, uh, all these things, and she's just like inside, like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> right? And she said, my roommate sat down next to me, didn't say a word, we watched the movie together, that was the best thing anyone did for me. Because it sucks, there's no spin to put on it. <clears throat> it sucks, don't spiritualize it, don't give it right. So, so much of it is just, like, when you understand what's going on, then you understand just how to be with somebody, or the modalities that you can use. I'm always on the hunt for more modalities. You know, because, let's say, there's going to be people that wouldn't do brain spawning or EMDR in a million years, it's just too freaking weird for them. Right? And then if you don't have another tool in your belt, what are you going to do? Jam it down their throat, right? I mean, I think it's a great question. I mean, do you guys need to know some modalities I know about? I'd be happy to hear them. Art therapy, 100%. Oh, yeah, right? Way. It's a less threatening way in, right? Mm -hmm. I had a girl like that where I just, I, I, I was just doing, winging it, but I had her come back to, to draw something, come back, and she drew an eye. And that opened up into this whole story of like her boyfriend getting murdered, this drug deal, and she was hiding about it. She never would have talked about that. Yeah, every day, and people spontaneously going into this stuff that, you know, I work with, I talk about one thing, and it just takes them right down there. They go into flow, time is gone. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Right brain. Mm -hmm. Therapy is a right brain endeavor. Mm -hmm. Once the experience has happened, you want to tie it into the left and make sense of it and ground it. But you can't lead with the left, or you won't get any experience, you know? But yeah, that's, I mean, that's what's great, you know? Anything else? I have a question specifically about EMDR. Um, I don't know if this question is more appropriate for like an EMDR conference, but I mean, this is what you do. So um, I was wondering in a, in a session if, if somebody's working on whatever it is, a seven and eight, and they start bringing up the memory that they have in mind that you ask them about, and then this probably happens all the time. All of a sudden, they'll have another memory, not the one that they planned on telling you about, but something else that pops in, happens all the time. Um, I was just wondering what, this is a very specific question, sure. what your response would be to um, somebody judging it, because on some level, the cognitions and thoughts are there, even though they're in a deep feeling state, and say they judge it as, oh, but what if this is a false memory? How do you respond to that, or do you not respond to that, and do you just have them keep going? If they're regulated, I would just keep going with them. And I would say, don't worry about that. It's just, there, there's something that you're feeling. It's more important that we just clear whatever you're feeling from the body. Okay. And that I'm rational. I've been doing this for a while and have a lot of different experiences. We're not, we're not gonna jump to any conclusions. That's why I was Usually things will shake out later on and stuff will make sense. So just go with it for now. And, you know, just, you. Yeah. But you're feeling you. something. That's the important part of it, you know? The other thing you can do too is if somebody has a high sud, um, there's ways that I make it as soft as possible for the client. So the most regulating part is the body sensation. There's a woman named Annabelle Gonzalez who's really high in the MDR community. I learned that from her. So you don't have to go to memory processing. You can, let's say if you did, and that's another way you can get to stuff earlier instead of waiting somebody to get a higher level of abstract tolerance. So if you just have them think about the event really quickly, like sticking your finger in light socket, and say, what do you, I just, I just want you to touch it and come back and just tell me what you feel in your body. So it's an ache here in the middle of my chest. And we're not gonna do any memory processing, nothing. All I wanna do is reduce this. So I'm just gonna do some real slow eye movements with you. And when I stop, same higher or lower. If your brain wants to jump the memories, just do your best to bring them back to the body sensation. So the prefrontal cortex, right, when you're seeing, thinking and all this stuff, you know, amygdala is firing which is low, and then it's only gonna throw gas on the fire. So your insula, which is kind of emotional recognition of the affect, the physical sensations of emotion and the body awareness is in the midbrain, it can downregulate the amygdala. So that's why it's a, it's a more um, resourced place to come in from, but you can go to stuff earlier than you would be able to, and maybe you just work with, so then if I get that, we're down to like a two, and they're like, they're fine to process the memory at that point. You know? Okay, that helps. But that thing that I was, you know, the four things I showed you, I've rarely had working in number two, the positive social, uh, positive using memories, I've rarely had that ever open up trauma. Which is great because then you can go right after this stuff day one and not open up all their trauma, you know. Last question. Right. Plenty more questions. <laughs> um, so I'm familiar with Levine and somatic experiencing. I've read some of the stuff. It's kind of dry sometimes. 
Uh, Brilliant, but dry. Yeah. Uh, any, anything that you would recommend concerning implicit memory, procedural memory, and, and trauma outside of the being, uh, any of the books or anybody you respect? Um, uh, obviously, like I've mentioned, the transforming power of affect by Donna Kosha. Uh -huh. That's her model. Um, the trauma, um, the body keeps the score by Bessel van der Kolk. Uh -huh. That's like I can't believe how many clients are coming to me reading that book now. Like this is a clinician's book, <laughs> but I have all these clients that are like I'm reading trauma and your body keeps the score, and they're like texting me photos of underlying stuff. And <laughs> so people, are, but that's a great book, and he was on the forefront of stuff getting beat up called all kinds of things that he was validated for. Um, both of his books that are like more like general population books like uh, Waking the Tiger or yeah. you know, Spoken Voice are good. Um, probably a couple of the books that were influential to me. I remember uh, Treating Complex post traumatic Stress Disorders by Julian Ford and Christine Courtois, I think it was. That was a great all around book that really taught me a lot about trauma. Um, healing trauma which is, um, like every chapter is a different author and modality. It's edited by, Dan, I think, Marion Solomon and Siegel, uh, a lot of stuff like that. I know I've bought my head, I'm trying to think of it. Yeah, that's great. Um, but that's the key, I'm telling you, man, implicit memories run the show. I mean, you should probably get sick of hearing me talk about implicit memories, because, but it's, it's the thing. And it's just, I mean, I can't tell you how wired we are to heal. It has so much forgiveness and leeway. Like you don't have to do this stuff perfectly. You don't have to like do it just right. I mean, it's it's, it's not a cushion there. Just being with somebody, you know, it's it's we're just wired, man. It's kind of it's really humbling. Like a lot of times I don't tell clients because I use a pointer for brain spotting. And like once you're in there, I'm just the guy with the stick. <laughs> you know, I've been called that. You know. The truth is in there looking for me, like, or some client, they're like, I think he's with the guy with the stick. <laughs> How about for that? How about for that? <laughs> it's like at first, when I first went to Janice, he said, Do you want to try a little this brain spot? And I said, What? He said, I'm paying you. <laughs> Drop that out. And he has this ability to just kind of freeze me in the moment, just, you know. Nothing's happening, and he's okay with it, and, and eventually I got okay with it. And before I knew it, something was happening. And, and they just go through these things, and, and really I shouldn't have paid him for those sessions because the look on his face when they were over was like he had more pleasure than I did. <laughs> but then, it, you know, it's not an every meeting occurrence. It's like every once in a while, it's you want to brainstorm on that, and I'll say, yeah, let's do a little of that. And now I'll say, I need a little brain spotting. <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, it's been a long session, but from my perspective, it's changed my life. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I had, I had the inability to have emotional. Mm -hmm. And, and that this really draws emotion out of you and gets you to feel like you've never felt before. And all the addictions really are very uh, kind of not important because it's just when you start feeling, your addictions just disappear. And I think that's uh, why I'm sitting here today because I've always wanted to understand better how he does it. Because it's just uh, yeah, really something to be a part of. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for all your questions. I think that's a great way to end the day on a moment of gratitude about how this amazing stuff that we do as clinicians, caretakers, helpers, professionals in the community of addiction and mental health do what we do. So again, thank you, John. We appreciate having you here. Safe travels to everyone who came from near and far. We've loved having you here. And please keep in touch. We have more lecture series to come this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.